Good evening, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming. I want to welcome you to the 2022 Rayburn Lecture. Thank you very much for being here. Um, the first thing I need to do, of course, is to thank Jane and Grayson Rayburn uh, for all their service to the university, but specifically for their generosity in making this lecture series possible. So thank you very much. I'd also like to acknowledge a few of our guests. Um, Provost Mosier is here. Thank you for joining us. Um, I also saw Dean Winstead. He's around here somewhere. Lost track of him. <laughs> um, Dr. Heinhorst, the Dean of the Honors College, is attempting to hide behind a student right now, but I can still see her. <laughs> um, we, we appreciate you being here. Our speaker tonight is Dr. Sarah Seeger, uh, an astrophysicist, professor of physics and planetary science at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Uh, she's been a pioneer in the study of exoplanets, that is, planets that orbit stars other than the sun. She's at the forefront of the search for the first Earth-like exoplanets and signs of life on them, is pursuing Venus as a habitable world, uh, which was the subject of her technical talk earlier this afternoon, and we thank her for that. Uh, her list of accomplishments is very long. We'll try and hit some highlights. Uh, Professor Seeger is a member of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, a recipient of the Sackler Prize in the Physical Sciences, and is an officer of the Order of Canada. Uh, she was awarded a MacArthur Genius Grant, has an asteroid 9729 named in her honor, and is the author of The Smallest Lights in the Universe, a memoir. Her talk tonight is called Exoplanets and the Search for Signs of Life Beyond Earth. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sarah Seeger. Nope, oh, there you go, right. Okay, well, good evening. I love to say my job is to search for alien life, but not little green humanoids. It's really more like that slime in your fridge. It's simple single-celled life that is giving off a kind of gas that we hope to be able to detect from afar. So today I'm here to tell you about exoplanets and the search for life beyond Earth. The story starts billions of years ago when a simple single-celled bacteria, cyanobacteria, figured out something very clever, how to harness energy from the environment. And in figuring out photosynthesis, these bacteria actually gave off waste gas oxygen, which we all need to breathe, and it fills our atmosphere today to 20% by volume. But without plants and photosynthetic bacteria, we would have no oxygen in our environment. And it's such a highly reactive gas, it shouldn't be there at all. So what I love to think about is an you know, al those aliens, the little green humanoids on another planet with the kind of telescopes we're hoping to build looking back at Earth. And that's how they'll be suspicious of life here. It's not by the Great Wall of China or city lights or pollution, but by a gas, oxygen in our atmosphere that doesn't belong here, that's way out of equilibrium with the environment. So that's like the snapshot of what I'm gonna talk about. And I just wanted to remind us all, just to make sure we're all on the same page, that every star in the sky is a sun. And if our sun has planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, etc., it makes sense that other stars have planets also, and they do. And recently, we have come up to the 5,000 mark. So astronomers are celebrating finding 5,000 planets around other stars. But we think there is evidence that every star has planets. So in our galaxy, the Milky Way, we have hundreds of billions of stars. So there's hundreds of billions of planets in our galaxy alone. And our universe has hundreds of billions of galaxies. So if you just do the math, I'm not allowed to assign homework, but I would say hundreds of billions of stars in our galaxy, hundreds of billions of galaxies. I was wondering how many of you think there might be life out there on one of those planets. Yeah, you're a self-selected audience, so, yeah. The problem we have is how to find that life. Right now, we can only search the very nearest stars. So today, what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to um, pose the question and give you an answer to the questions that I get asked most often by people of all walks of life. 
Now, one of these questions, I'm going to let you think about it, is the one I get asked the very most often. And you can think about which one that is, and when I get there, I will tell, tell you. So the first question, what is an exoplanet? I kind of already answered that question, but we use data and very complicated computer models to try to describe them. And instead of telling you about all my complicated models, I'm going to go tell you like a bit about how we imagine exoplanets in our mind based on models. And there's a series of NASA travel posters. It's supposed to inspire you to think someday we might go there. And this poster is Kepler 186F, where the grass is always redder on the other side. Because there are planets orbiting red dwarf stars, where the star just gives off red light. And people are imagining that there are plants of different colors. Rela ex relax, um, experience the gravity of HG 40307G, a super-Earth. Because planets seem to come in all masses, sizes, and orbits. And here, they're just imagining going to, and I can't even imagine parachuting on this Earth, but they're imagining parachuting on another Earth where the gravity is really high. Relax on Kepler 16b, where your shadow always has company. Because there are planets that orbit two stars. So you would have two shadows and see two sunsets. And I like to say science fiction got some things right. Any Star Wars fans out there? Yes. So in these exoplanets, we have so many of them, we try to parse them. And I know there are some art and music majors here, so I don't have too many graphs, but I want to have something for the science folks. So you don't have to understand this to understand the rest of the talk, but let's take this graph on the left here, where um, this is showing you the planet. Each point is a planet. It's not showing all of them, but a selection. This is showing you planet mass in Earth masses, and this is orbital period, the time it takes a planet to go around its star in days. Okay, so Earth is here at one year orbit and at one Earth mass. But what I want you to look at here is how big the axes are. This is going from orbital periods of like a day, less than a day, to like 100,000 days. Huge, huge variety. Same with mass. Some planets have the Earth mass. Some are 1,000, 10,000 times more massive. The fact that these points of planets are all across this entire graph it means that planets come in all sizes, all masses, literally all orbits. It is astonishing for us scientists who long ago thought that planets only formed to become really big like Jupiter, like as big as possible, or small rocky worlds like Earth. The fact that there's everything in between, it is just like shaken the field of planetary science. And there's a couple things I can point out here. So our Earth, it takes us 365 days to go around the sun. Look at this on this graph here, orbital period, 100 days, 10 days, one day, less than one day. Some planets, it takes them less than one day to go around their star. There's planets, I mean, this clump here, um, there are planets that are two to three times the size of Earth. We don't know what they're made of or how they form, yet they appear to be the most common planets in our galaxy. Now, if they're the scientists in the room, your brain is trying to probably pick out clumps and patterns. You can't really do it, this graph, it's not, the planets aren't treated that way. But I assure you, there are strange patterns in our planet population that people are trying to sort through. So this first question, um, what is an exoplanet? It's a planet that orbits a star other than the sun. There are thousands of them right now. And we've got evidence that every star has a planetary system. So the next time you go outside and it's uh, not pouring <laughs> with rain, and look up at the night sky, you can look at a star and you can ask yourself what kind of planet might be around that star. And when I do that, I love to imagine that there are intelligent beings around, on a planet around that star looking back at our sun, a star to them, and wondering the same thing. So, okay, now you know what an exoplanet is and you might have known that before you got here. But now, the next question that I get asked commonly is when and how will we find another Earth? It's a pretty good question. And the problem isn't that an Earth is hard to find necessarily. Because an Earth isn't faint. An Earth, let's say, at you know, 10 light years, 100 light years away, it's far, but it's not fainter than the faintest galaxy ever observed by Hubble, let's say. The problem is the Earth, it's next to a big, bright, massive sun. That's very, very hard to see. You know, like on a bright, sunny day, like the glare is just killing you. 
And it turns out that, quantitatively speaking, our Earth is um, 100 times smaller than our Sun. It is 300,000 times less massive. And our Earth is 10 billion times fainter than our Sun in invisible light. So if you are going to um, take a break from what you're working, take, let's say, a sabbatical, and work on exoplanets, and try to find another Earth, which method would you choose? Would you choose one that involves planet size? We can't see the planet by itself. It's kind of caught in the glare and the mass of its star. We have to have a technique that tries to sort out the signal. So would you try a method that involves size, where the Earth is 100 times smaller than the sun? You don't have to raise your hand, but that, that OK, that's, we've got one volunteer there. Would you try a method that involves mass? The Earth is 300,000 times less massive. Think about that as measuring something to so many decimal places. You're building, let's say, a deck on the back of your house. Are you going to measure each plank to, let's say, it's um, you know, 10 feet, 0 0.001? Like you're probably not even going to do that. But imagine you're going to measure the Earth in reflected light. You're going to have to measure that plank to 10 feet to the 0 0.000000001. That's really hard. In any field of science, it's very few fields of science want to make that type of precise measurement impossible. Anyone volunteer for that one? <laughs> no. That's my favorite method, and although I won't cover it in my talk, you can ask me in the Q&A, and I'll tell you how we want to do that. But for now, if you were sort of leaning to the easier one, I'm not sure if this is a crowd who wants to do the easier thing or the harder thing. Well, it actually would be the first one because they're the number, you know, the numbers are the smallest. That's actually the main way we're finding planets today. And we call this the transit method. Do you see the um, fake planet going in front of the fake star on top there? We don't spatially resolve any star like that other than our sun. We don't see that, but what we do is we measure what's on the bottom. I'm going to play that one more time. So we measure the brightness of a star as a function of time, and we're looking for a tiny drop in brightness when the planet goes in front of the star as seen from Earth. Now, not all the planets do that. The system has to be aligned just so. Imagine if a planet is orbiting like the star this way in the plane of the sky, it will never, ever go in front of the star. It's like a numbers game. And we look at lots and lots of stars at one time looking for this tiny drop in brightness. And this drop in brightness is related to the area ratio. So the area of that disk, pi r squared of that planet, compared to pi r squared of that whole star. So yeah, right now, out of MIT, we run a mission for NASA. It's called TESS, like the girl's name, except it stands for Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. And there's a cartoon, there's an artist's conception of it in the top left. It's like about this tall and this big. And it has four um, glorified telephoto lenses with giant baffles all stacked together to observe the sky. And on the bottom left there, it's like one tiny piece of the sky that TESS observes. See all those stars? Imagine if it was your job to find transiting planets. In a minute, I'm going to give you a mini tutorial and let you have a shot at finding a planet in the data. But on the bottom right, there's real data from a star. And this is time in hours. This is relative brightness. It's normalized to zero. But do you see um, there's a drop in brightness here. This is a real star showing a real planet. There's lots of stars. And what we do is we have automated uh, computers. They literally uh, find the center of every one of those points, and they look up a star in a catalog, if the star has already been cataloged. And they figure out the brightness of a star as a function of time. And then computers sort through, um, we call it detrending the data, and looking for that drop in brightness that might be a planet. And the computers do this pretty quickly, actually. We have lots of computers. They might take a few days. By the way, TESS observes a giant strip of the sky every month. But at the end of the day, after the computer does its job, it spits out maybe like several hundred, what might be starting with hundreds of thousands of stars, it whittles it down to a few hundred possible planets. Because a lot of things can mimic that, that curve. And believe it or not, we have humans at the end who vet. We call it vet, like vet, they check out quality. And they actually sort through the light curves. And as a group, they don't vote if it's a planet or not, but they vote to nominate the object to become worthy of planet candidate. 
And then astronomers all around the globe do some extra work to figure out whether the object is a planet or not. And this is uh, one of the team early on. The test mission actually launched in 2018. And here's like a small group of people. Everyone's usually pretty young on the team. This person here, Natalia, she, after she trained, she ended up running like this whole planet finding, this final stage of planet finding um, at MIT for the test mission. So these sophisticated computers do most of the work and then the team of humans, we have a lot of extra auxiliary info that we use to weigh whether they're, they're planet candidates or not. Okay, I'm gonna like warm you up now for doing some planet finding here. And we're not, it's not a quiz, like we're not grading anyone, so I want you to be able to enjoy this. Okay, so what we're showing you at the top is um, real data taken by TESS. I'm not gonna go through the y-axis, but just look, each of these points is an observation. It's um, messy like that because there's, uh, we call it shot noise or Poisson noise. It's um, because the photons don't all arrive at the same time. I mean, for your purposes, you can just kind of ignore this. What you're looking for is a drop in brightness that might be a planet candidate, okay? So on the top here, the drops typically last about a, a few hours, an hour to a few hours. But on the top here, these numbers represent days, um, time and days. And it's a kind of crazy astronomy scale called barycentric Julian date, very jargony. And the computer's actually flags for you where it thinks there's a transit, okay? So this is about 30 days. There are gaps in the data when the spacecraft is downlinking data. It can't observe and downlink data at the same time. It's like you walking and looking at your phone at the same time, although some of you can probably do that. And at the bottom, we're not gonna really rely on the top graph very much. It's the bottom graph I want you to look at and I've made a note of what you're looking for. So the black points are data, the blue points are average data, and the red line is a model fit. So what you're looking for is you're looking for a box shape because the planet goes in front of the star and it crosses the limb of the star fairly quickly. So the drop in brightness happens pretty fast. So in terms of time, in hours, it's about 20 minutes, you get the drop in brightness. Once the planet is uh, transiting the star, it's fully superimposed on the star, nothing much changes with time, so it's pretty flat at the bottom, and then it rises again. So that's what we're looking for, box shape, small, small drop in brightness, flat light curve. I'm gonna have that on every slide, so you don't have to remember that. Now, the most insidious false positive, the most kind of common thing out there, it's not a planet orbiting a star, but it's two stars orbiting each other. And you see the cartoon where you have this yellow star and the red star, and they're orbiting each other, when the small star goes in front of the bigger star, you get this drop in brightness called the primary eclipse, but then the small star can go behind the big star, and then we're missing some light because the small star is now blocked from view. So look at this. The transits are different. Or you have a giant transit, a small transit, and a giant one. Also, you can get a V shape because the way that this is crossing, it's blocking out a different amount um, as it's crossing because of the geometry. You didn't have to understand all that to kind of enjoy the planet finding exercise. So let's take our first one, okay? So at the top, you can see as a function of time, there are these transits constantly happening. The bottom is like bin data where the computer takes every drop and like superimposes it so they can try to get a stronger signal. So we're looking for, let's see if you agree, uh, box shape, anyone want to agree? No, it's a V shape. I see a lot of shaking heads. Small drop in brightness. I actually didn't go over the y-axis, so it's hard for you to know if that's small or big, but it's, whoa, pretty in your face. Uh, flat bottom light curve? No, okay. This actually is a binary star. And remember I said that the eclipses alternate? So look, you have a deep eclipse, shallow, deep, shallow, deep, shallow. It's different, right? Odd, even, odd, even. So this one is actually a binary star, not a transit. I feel like it's like reading a book sometimes because you're kind of going through the different options. Okay, let's look at this one. We're looking for a box shape. Yep, I see a lot of yeses. Small drop in star brightness. This is tricky because again, I didn't go through what the scale is for you. So let, let's leave that one out for now. Flat bottom light curve. Yes, actually, this one actually is a planet. It's a very beautiful, like obvious planet. And this was a known planet already because in the star light fields that Tess is looking at, there are some planets that are already known to exist. So this is kind of like a test case for us. It's known to be a planet in advance of us 
looking at this light curve. OK, now we're going to mix it up a bit. Let's look at this bottom graph. Um, we're looking for a box shape, small drop in brightness, flat bottom light curve. Well, this red line, it's not a, for the people who work with data, it's not supposed to be the best fit to data. It's a transit model. What models the geometry of a planet transiting its star? What's the best model that comes close to fitting the data? But if you ask, does the red line go through the blue points? The blue points, remember, are the average data. The black points are the real data. Uh, do you think this red line goes through all the blue points? It doesn't actually go through very well. Now, look at, let's look at the top for a minute. Whoa, what is this star doing? It's amazing, but every like, day or so, it's getting brighter and then getting dimmer. Does this look like a box shape at all on top there? It does not. This is actually a pulsating star. And the computer got confused, and it wanted to somehow think that um, some of these little points down here, where the computer's flagging in blue, that there was a transit. But when it's all superimposed together, it's looking like this kind of wavy curve. It's not a planet either. OK, ready to keep going? I have a couple more for you. Let's look at this one now. So the top here, our eyes can't pick anything out. But the whole point is that the computer, I don't know if I'd call it smarter than we are, but it has a way of averaging data and looking for increased signal and putting data together. So the computer has like a leg up on us humans because it's able to fold the data together and look for a signal. And it also gives you a little blue mark. Now let's look at this. This is a harder one. Do you see a box shape? This is a trick one on purpose. A small drop in brightness. Flat bottom light curve. This is the kind of tricky thing. OK, by the way, so I condense like you know two months of training into about three minutes. <laughs> but here, look, look at this. So you know, and let's imagine for a moment you're the group of humans vetting you know the ones that the computer spat out at the end of the sorting through hundreds of thousands of stars. Do you want to be the one responsible for not upvoting a planet to get examined by the community? Like, would you want to be the one who, you know, misses the other Earth? Yeah, so we're usually pretty generous in letting things go. But let's talk about this one for a moment. Remember that the red line is the best transit geometry model that can match the data. Okay, so this one might look like a planet because it, fall, it fit all of our three criteria. But I want you to um, look here for a moment. See, there's a drop, but look at these blue points. There's a rise. And do you notice that this rise, it's like equal to the drop, actually. That's not good for a planet, actually. It's not a good sign of a planet, because the planet can only block light. In the case we're talking about, it doesn't contribute any light. So some, if you can see like an equal rise to a drop, it's probably just noise in the data. The star itself has star spots, or just maybe the instrument uh, temperature wasn't right, or there was just something going on. So this, one's, this type of thing, we'd usually well, we have auxiliary data, too, so there's a lot of information I'm not giving you that we would have to help weigh in whether this one deserves to be a planet candidate. OK, this one's the last one. So yeah, we're looking for a box shape, small drop in star brightness, flat bottom light curve. Anyone want to vote that this one looks like a planet? I love everyone being bold and, and voting. And it doesn't have the problems the other one had, like that crazy sawtooth pattern. It doesn't have the, you know, if you look at it, there's no weird up thing at the end of the transit. It's amazing. And look at this. This is in days. So this is about uh, 30 days. And look how often there's a little blue thing. What's amazing is your eye can't see a transit. But the computer, remember, it's folding all the data. It's adding all that data together. In those, it's like cutting that data and adding it together to be able to amplify the signal. This is incredible. If this is a planet, then every time it transits, every time it goes around the star, it's a very short amount of time, less than one day. And this one actually ended up being a planet. It's an artist's conception. We needed follow-up observations to confirm planet status. And this is an incredible planet. It's about Earth mass and size. The whole system is pretty far away, relatively speaking. But it turned out that it's a planet very close to a small red dwarf star. And follow-up observations by a now dead uh, Spitzer Space Telescope indicate that it has no atmosphere. It's so close to the star, kind of like a Mercury. So that one ended up being a planet. And uh, I hope you enjoyed that exercise. 
If you really want, at the end of the day, like you can actually go home and when we get data, there's another group that like dumps this data and you can do that whole thing on your own actually, search for planets and do like a crowdsourcing data. So that was just like a little interlude to give you a flavor of planet finding actually. And I hope that you find it interesting that real groups of people get together and do this in a bit of a more sophisticated way. But at the end of the day, our eyes are really powerful tools for seeing patterns in data. So after that little interlude, I wanted to share with you that we still can't find another Earth with this method, actually. And in astronomy, we just try to make our job as easy as possible. It sounds a bit lazy, but we're still trying to do the easy things first, okay? And so instead of looking for a transit, a planet transiting a sun-like star, we are looking for planets transiting very small stars. So do you see the planet, the fake planet, transiting a real image of our sun? And now look at this fake planet, the same size, transiting a small red dwarf star. Do you see the planet, it takes out so much more light of that small star than the big star, right? Way, way more. So our signal from our Earth compared to our sun is one part in 10,000 because of the size of the Earth and the area of the Earth compared to the area of the sun. But for these small worlds, it's only one part in 100. And let's go back to that measuring the planks for your deck analogy. Look, I don't build my own deck either, but okay, you'd only measure it to point zero zero. Uh, you'd measure it to point zero one, which sounds a lot easier than point zero 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 one. And so the whole field is sort of flooded towards planets around small stars, actually. And I want to break up here for a moment. I want to, for a moment, take you on a virtual trip to a planet orbiting a red dwarf star. Let's imagine for a moment, because we can't do this, but we could get in a. Actually, has anyone here ever tried the? Um, Oculus, like the virtual reality, yeah. I wish we could do that, I don't have this for you, but it would be amazing if we could do that and take a virtual trip to one of these worlds. Now, some, in the, some of these um, planets, they're very close to the star. And in fact, these small red dwarf stars, they give off very little energy. So in order for a planet to be warm enough for life, the planet has to be pretty close to the star. And the closer a planet is to the star, the shorter its period to go around based on Kepler's third law. So on this planet, the artist has used the artist's license to make that star very big in the sky. Imagine if we visit this world and the star, your sun, it's like, wow, huge in the sky. And the artist used the artist's license to make a different color. We don't know what color the atmosphere is. We do know a lot of exoplanets seem to have clouds. We don't know much about them. And they're also showing other planets in the same system. Now what's really amazing is that the planets that are so close to the star, over, um, over time, they get in this really special configuration. It's called tidally locked. They rotate one time for every time they orbit. Just like the moon, it always shows the same face to Earth. So think about that. The planet rotating one time for every time it orbits. That's so weird. It means that one year is the same as one day. Not only that, what it means for us, if we could visit this planet, is that star, the sun, would be in the same place in the sky at all times. So where would you go to visit? Where it's always day? I see a lot of yeses, but if you like astronomy, you would go to where it's always night. Or you could go to where the sun is always setting. That would probably wobble a bit. It's not like exactly perfect like that, but it's just so bizarre. Maybe those folks are thinking that we're so bizarre because <laughs> we have day and night and it's, it's yeah. Now on these planets, um, it's, the time to go around is very short, right? Because for a planet where the temperature is good for life. So on a planet like that, um, imagine if it takes 10 days for the planet to go around the star. If you're a kid in the audience, I want you to think about your birthday being once a year. The planet takes only 10 days. A year is 10 days. So every 10 days, you'd get your birthday, which would be great for the kid. But the parents, that would be really bad. I think they'd celebrate birthdays maybe every 100 years. <laughs> now, visiting one of these might not be such a great idea after all, because these red dwarf stars, they give off a lot of flares. So I'm glad no one has their phone now. It's, you have good audience etiquette. But you couldn't always have your phone out, because high energy particles coming off the star during those flares would actually knock out the electronics. Like, what kind of sunscreen would we bring? Any biologists, you know, we might get cancer, because these high energy particles are very, very bad. Okay, so here I understand you get tornado warnings. 
Back in the Northeast where we live, we have um, snow days. So there can be a day when there's like a forecast for so much snow, we can get like this much snow in a day. Everything shuts down and you're just kind of told to stay off the roads. You know, I imagine on a planet like this, there could be days with giant solar storms or stellar storms from their star. And I'm guessing they would be told to take the day off, don't go outside because of all that high energy particle, go in your basement. Only here you don't have basements. So I'm not sure you'd have to have a special room, you know, to protect you from radiation. Now, our sun, by the way, um, in the late 1850s, we had an amazing event here on Earth. And has anyone here heard about it? It's called the Carrington Event. Wow, we have a lot of enthusiasts in the room. I'll tell you this for a moment. So during this event, um, and a British amateur astronomer named Carrington, he was studying sunspots, and he noticed that they brightened. And a day and a half later, our Earth became electrified. The northern and southern lights, which you can never see here, you could see them from this latitude. They were so bright that you could go outside and read a book by them. Telegraph operators saw some wires catch fire, and they could take the batteries out of their telegraph, and it would still work. And what happened, believe it or not, was a small part of our sun uh, came off just in these giant flares. Sometimes um, part of our sun gets ejected. In fact, it's called a coronal mass ejection. And I have a picture of one here taken by a satellite. This isn't one like the one I'm describing, but here you can see a solar flare and you can see part of our sun coming off our sun. And this part of the sun that came here in the 1850s, it had a magnetic field embedded in it. And when that magnetic field hit Earth's magnetic field, it induced a current. Now, no one died, but that was, a lot. imagine like our power grid, like catching fire and like burning down. It's, that's like a different kind of pandemic people do worry about. Okay, I didn't mean to like worry everybody, but I wanted to tell you about this one interesting planet that's our favorite right now called TRAPPIST-1 system. And that's, believe it or not, that star has been seen to give off in an 80-day period that it was observed, 40, four zero flares. And one of those flares extrapolating back from the data to the total energy output from the star at that time is equivalent to the Carrington event. So if we imagine visiting a planet around a small red dwarf star, not all of them, but many of them, they're way more active than our sun, giving off a lot more flares. And that would just be like a regular thing on that planet. It's like really absolutely astonishing, right? That that, I don't know if life has to be very resistant to high energy particles or if it has to live underground or on the night side of the planet. But um, it's just a kind of, I'm just trying to give you a flavor for how different stars and planets can be from our own Earth. And there's this favorite star system, it's called TRAPPIST-1. It's real uh, name, it's got this very long name from a catalog, 2 mass, J23, et cetera, et cetera. So if the star either doesn't have a name or it's from a catalog, then astronomers get to name the planet. But you're not allowed to name it after like your friend or we could name it after Professor and Mrs. Rayborn. <laughs> we can't pick people's names, it just gets another catalog name. And so the astronomers who found this particular star, this planet system, they named it TRAPPIST-1 because they called their telescope TRAPPIST. And the system here, you can see by now, recognize the box shape, the shallow drop in brightness, et cetera, et cetera. These are very beautiful transit light curves. There's a real uh, relative brightness scale here. So if you're fast at reading graphs, you can see this drop in brightness is like about uh, a percent. And yeah. Isn't this cute, though, how the transits last longer for different planets? The further the planet is from the star, the longer it takes to orbit the star, and the longer the transit duration will be. So um, this is just showing you a cartoon, a corner of our sun, so our sun would be giant, and this is the size of the star, the TRAPPIST-1 star. Any smaller and colder, it wouldn't be a star, wouldn't be able to have fusion on the inside. But this TRAPPIST-1 system, it's incredible. It's got seven planets, they're all uh, small, like Earth, and this is like our, just try to remember that TRAPPIST-1 name, okay? Because this is the favorite star system to search for signs of life and to search for the planets being potentially able to host life. It's uh, yeah, very favorable in many, many ways for follow-up observations. Magnetic field, uh, star brightness, <laughs> flares. All right, so how will we find another Earth? We can't find the Earth twin right now. We have to do the easiest thing, which is using the most favorable planet finding technique, searching for transits around the most favorable type of planet star system. 
a small planet transiting a small red dwarf star. That's where we're at right now in this search. So did anyone um, think about what the most question I get asked most often, or the favorite question for all the people everywhere, no matter education? It's this question, actually. Can we go there? So anyone want to guess that answer right now? OK, so the answer is stars are very far away. You know, if, if this was our Earth, if this, was our, um, this is our sun, how big do you think the Earth is compared to this sun here? There's a clue on this plot here. Yeah, there's a sunspot there, and I searched for a real image of our sun that had a sunspot about the size of Earth. So in this little exercise about distances, if that's the size of the sun and that's the size of Earth, how far away do you think Earth is from this screen? You can put your hand up if you think it's where you're sitting, or you can maybe make a guess in your own mind. Like, how far is Earth is all to scale here? Like, it turns out, so in astronomy, we um, like to just round things up or down. But you can think of our Earth being about 100 sun diameters away from our sun. So if we take this sun here and, like, count 100, that's not in this room. It's somewhere out. You'd have to tell me the name of whatever building, like, it'll hit. Maybe across there. Yeah. So now, imagining this is the size of our star, where do you think the next star would be? I haven't worked this one out, so this would be a good homework assignment. Or this would be an easy one to pick on a physics student for. I'm not going to pick on anyone. <laughs> but, you know, far, very far. You know, usually, if this is about, this is like, seems bigger than 30 centimeters, but the number I carry in my head, if this is about 30 centimeters, it's like from coast to coast in the United States. So I don't know if we could say that's like here to, let's, you know, say British Columbia in Canada, like far. And that's the nearest star. And right now, you know, our nearest star um, is still very far away. It's, it's very far. So can we go there? Well, <laughs> it's not really possible now because our, the fastest that we know how to travel in space, not even with a human, but just our spacecraft, they would take 70,000 years to reach the nearest star system. So in this field of exoplanets, though, it's really interesting field because the line between what we consider crazy, crazy, and what we consider mainstream research, that line is constantly shifting. So back before, let's like say 25 years ago, when I started working on science, it was really hard to work on exoplanets. There was maybe like four exoplanets. People didn't believe they were planets. They just thought it was like noise in the data or a pulsation of a star. Remember all the false positives in the exercise I gave you? Most of them were not planets. It was a different technique. But it was really um, considered laughable. You know, people wouldn't take this seriously at all. Today, look how serious it is. You all came to hear about exoplanets. And now I'm going to tell you about an idea that's just kind of on the other side of that crazy line. And that's a way to get there, actually. Not us humans, but there are people like putting real money into ways we might find to send spacecraft to other planetary systems. And this particular, this one here is called Starshot. And here the concept, star shot, here the concept is to send out little tiny space chips, not spaceship, space chip. That'd be like all the functionalities of a, that we need on like a little tiny computer board. And we would launch thousands of these, each of which would deploy a solar sail that would be a few meters in diameter. Just like in the springtime when, I always like to think of the baby turtles all being born and they run out to the ocean. They don't all survive, right? It's kind of sad. So in this case, the goal is to launch thousands of them so that they won't all make it. But once these space chips you know, deploy their sail, the concept is to have a giant bank of lasers, which would take up like a square kilometer, and they would shine coherently to accelerate without like evaporating these solar sails, which are very thin, by the way. If you were to go like this on the solar sail material, it would just disintegrate. It would accelerate them to like a um, a fifth the speed of light, and they would go very fast, as fast as you could imagine, at a 20th the speed of light, and they would take 20 years to get to the nearest star system. And they have no way to slow down. They would, this laser, by the way, it's um, like photon pressure. So we don't have like a good intuition on that, but it's like if you push on something and it moves, these photons push against the sail and make them accelerate. And they would then have a speed and they would zip by the nearest star system, snap some images, and then it would take four years, because this nearest star is four light years away for that data to get back. 
So I don't know if you're impressed with that or, or if you think that's crazy. Yeah, you're impressed. But the thing is, it's amazing, right? Because someone, uh, it's sort of not a, it's sort of politically incorrect now, but a Russian billionaire who got his money from like the oligarch system, he put in $100 million to this project. It's like people take this seriously enough to work on this project. We're not sure if this is going to work. There's a lot of hard challenges. I personally thought the hardest thing was, was to get the square kilometer of land and build all those lasers. Like, you can't have an aircraft flying overhead. I thought that was impossible, but they're working like to get land somewhere like outback Australia where there's a defunct power plant. So we'll see where this goes. But the point is that, wow, taking this idea seriously. So we can't go there now, but there may be some way to, to get this done. By the way, um, I just have this question for the audience here, because I see there's a lot of college students, but let's say, you had an, let's say there, you had an opportunity to go in a spacecraft, either being like hibernated or just you know, living in a spacecraft, to travel to the nearest star. And let's imagine we could travel at a tenth the speed of light. So it would take 40 years to get there. I was wondering if anyone would be motivated to sign up for this you would be the first person to like, go to another planet or another star. See, this, like, this is why it's the most common question, because people are putting their hands up. They want to go. Now, I forgot to say that's a one-way trip. Because if you're a college student now, you're about 20, you'll be 60 when you get there. Yeah, and so you're still, people are still enthused. You'd still go, because it's our human desire to explore. It's we want to go there. OK, so after all that, the follow-up question I get, that's the final question is if we can't go there, why look? Because after all that excitement about imagining we can send little star chips or maybe some way go ourselves, we can't do that, why, why look? You know, it's really interesting. I hope that some of you are Star Trek fans. Yeah, okay, great, wow, it's so great. I didn't know that younger generation is still Star Trek original fans. But you know, science fiction got some things wrong. So in Star Trek, the they have to travel, the Enterprise has to travel at incredible speeds to go vast distances so Spock can analyze the planet, right, and see if it's habitable or if there are life forms there. If they tried to do a movie about astronomers searching for life elsewhere, honestly, it would be super boring. We're doing like meetings and email and we're, computer coding is fun, it's really fun to do, but it's not fun to like watch someone debugging very slow. And we don't need to go there. We actually look from here. We use the Hubble Space Telescope, to study hot, giant exoplanet atmospheres. And we do have something exciting coming up. So hopefully, a couple of years from now, you can have another speaker come at, for some seminar to give you an update. But we've got a brand new telescope called the James Webb Space Telescope. And I'm going to say, because everyone's been so enthused here, I'd like to know if anyone woke up at 6 AM on Christmas morning to watch the launch of this. See, oh my god, you are just amazing me. You're a fantastic audience. So this telescope, it used to be called Next Generation Space Telescope, as in like Next Hubble. And it's been like 30 years from concept to launch. And it finally launched. And its launch window, you know, it kept getting pushed years and then days. And then it was going to launch um, Christmas morning, which was 7 AM East Coast time, 6 AM here. And it was the most perfect launch. Honestly, it couldn't have been better. Not like an extra ounce of fuel had to be used. It was just amazing. And the telescope um, traveled a million miles away from Earth. It's in a very new environment where it's dark and cold, and it's good for astronomy. And the telescope looks kind of funny, right? But there's no, it's too big. It's six and a half meter in diameter. It's too big to like cover it with like a giant, you know, uh, baffle. Like most telescopes, they're enclosed. And so it has to have this giant tennis court sized sun shield that was all folded up and had to deploy. It couldn't get tangled, and every single thing on this telescope has so far been perfectly. In fact, some of you have probably seen, they showed off an image to, they were trying to see if they te um, test out the telescope, and they put it on a star, and in the background were like countless galaxies that had ne most had never been seen before. So this telescope, we're counting on it, it's going to be observing exoplanet atmospheres. And the TRAPPIST-1 system is like our number one, every TRAPPIST planet will be observed, all these rocky worlds are going to be studied. And it's like our hope for finding a planet that might show signs of life. So you've all seen a rainbow, and you may or may not know that if you could examine the rainbow very closely, we would see that parts of the rainbow are missing. This is a rainbow made not by raindrops, but by an instrument called a spectrograph inside a telescope. 
and it's splitting up the white light from our sun into many colors. And see all the little pieces missing? Those are from molecules, gases in Earth's atmosphere or the sun's atmosphere, absorbing light. I like to say that the molecules they, in atoms, they take bites out of the spectrum. But people, experts, can identify each one of these with a specific atom or molecule. And that's how a, a lot of astronomy is done by spectra. So that's what we're doing, is we're trying to look at atmospheres. We're taking the light and breaking it up into its constituent colors, in the infrared mostly, and we're looking for gases by identifying like, parts of light that are missing. And in exoplanets, you know, um, Earth and Venus, they are about the same size, about the same mass. Their atmospheres are completely different. They're two very, very different worlds. So we need to look at atmospheres to learn more. And I do have, I'm not gonna talk about this unless someone asks after, because it's a bit too complicated. But if later you want to know really how we're gonna do this with the web, I will tell you. But it's getting towards the end of my talk and I didn't want to overcomplicate things for you. Instead, I just want to um, you know, wrap up with what are we looking for? Um, and if you were to um, look at all the, so the web, it's mapped out what it's gonna do for the, its first year in science. It's a competitive process where astronomers like write a proposal and peers review it. So we know what it's gonna look at. But for all the rocky worlds, transiting M dwarf stars, the first thing it's gonna do is only establish if these planets have atmospheres at all. Because remember the flares and the story about the coronal mass ejections and the high energy particles? Like honestly, we're not sure if these planets can withstand all of that, if the atmosphere doesn't get like blown away, evaporated off. So number one is do they have atmospheres? Number two is do the atmospheres have water vapor? which on a small rocky world indicates a liquid water ocean. And if we, sort of, if we establish those two things, then we can hammer away and get more and more data to look for molecules in the atmosphere. It would be like oxygen or methane or isoprene, or we are working through literally every single possibility that could be there. It's gonna be a stretch for this telescope. It's not, it's not a slam dunk. It's gonna be very hard to see the signal. And I put this cartoon here to say that we have to ask a series of questions. What might life produce? Can a dead planet with volcanoes fool us? How do we interpret very limited data? And how do we quantify our uncertainties? So this part of the story, there's actually no conclusion yet because I and others are still working through all the possibilities. We're still waiting for our data from the James Webb Space Telescope to see how well that telescope performs. But uh, that is science for you. It's kind of an ongoing process, and it just keeps unfolding. So I have to leave you hanging on this one. We're, we know what we're looking for. We don't know what we'll find. We don't know if the telescope is capable, but we're gonna um, keep our fingers crossed and hope that we get lucky, that nature has produced for us, and that life, life is everywhere. So if we can't go there, why look? We do remote sensing with space telescopes to find and identify these uh, so-called Earth-like planets to search for signs of life by way of gases in the atmosphere that don't belong. So now I'm gonna summarize for you, the, recap the questions and answers. What is an exoplanet? A planet that orbits stars other than the sun. When and how will we find another Earth? That's the takeaway. We can't do Earth twins yet. We are searching for small rocky planets around small red dwarf stars. Can we go there? Not for now. And why are we looking? We're gonna study these planets remotely to search for signs of life. So to conclude, I'd like to wish you um, clear thoughts, clear skies, and your own journey of exploration. Thank you so much for your attention. So now we do have time for some questions. Yes. Yes. Light takes light to the question is if there is life on another planet and let's say it's far away. I mean, everything's far, but let's say it's 10, 20, 100, 1,000 light years away. 
and they see our planet, yes, what they're seeing is coming from that many light years away, because it takes light time to get there. So let's say they got light from our planet uh, from 200 years ago. Then, yeah, they'd be seeing what's there. But remember, they can't see much. They couldn't see, like, the Great Wall of China or city lights or pollution. So they might not notice a difference over 200 years. And even though here, like, we're worried about the rise of carbon dioxide, they couldn't see that change even from far away, not w at least with the telescopes we're trying to build. Great first question. Yes? That's such a tough question. The question is, if we do find signs of life out there, and we don't know if it's intelligent life, because we just see a gas that doesn't belong, we don't know if that's like that slime in your fridge or you know, bona fide like, intelligent humanoid, we won't know. What does it mean for us? That question, I don't have all the answers. That one is almost like a personal choice question. What would it mean for you? I mean, I think for a lot of us, we're just wondering, you know, why are we here? We all have a different answer to that. We want to know, you know, if life is out there, and we don't have a good answer for you. And just to be honest, we're just so busy trying to find life, actually, we don't often reflect and try to sort through all the, all the meaning of it. Curiosity. Curiosity. Yes? Well, it's going to study planet-forming disks, so very young stars, and look for disks around it. It's trying to study very, very distant galaxies to see if it can see like back to the beginnings of our universe. It'll study solar system planets. It studies like so many different things. Thanks. Sure. Yes. Bright sun like stars? Yeah. There's definitely a way to do that. And I do, I'm going to take this opportunity to just give you uh, a couple more slides because that was the one part in 10 billion that's incredibly hard. And there's like a breathtaking idea that actually is my favorite. Um, some people do have to leave, so feel free to go. But imagine the idea of putting a giant screen in space to block out the starlight so we can see a planet directly. That's what we're trying to do, actually. That is um, what we want to do. And people have thought about this for, for decades. But if any of you are taking undergraduate physics or remember from high school, what happens if you block out a point source of light? I don't know if you know, but you get a ringed pattern. You actually get these ripples shown here. It's really hard to see, but you see these ripples? Because light can act like a wave, and it can actually bend around the edges of a giant screen. Just like dropping a pebble in a pond, you'll see ripples. Light will make ripples, and you won't be able to block out the starlight to find planets, because these ripples are brighter than the planets you're looking for. So in the 1960s, people actually thought about making a giant screen a very special shape. Look at this star shape here. And then the light bends around the edges of this star-shaped pattern and creates what you see on the right here. It would be like dropping a pebble in a pond and instead of seeing ripples, the surface would be perfectly smooth. And all the waves would be pushed to the outer edges. And we call this starshade. And starshade uh, would be all folded up. It would unfurl from its stowed position. It's a giant, specially shaped screen, 10 called the starshade. And the starshade has to be made incredibly precisely. These petals and how flat they are with respect to each other. Starshade is attached to a spacecraft and it would block out starlight so we can see the planets directly from a telescope that works together. Starshade's actually a real thing. It's um, being made. There's a petal. There's me and my team with one of the petals. Giant, right? Here's the Starshade Lab at NASA JPL. So there's, that's the main idea, is using something to block out starlight that's a very special shape to combat diffraction. Yes? Very far. Remember when I was saying the line between mainstream and crazy is constantly shifting? And by the way, people revisited Starshade every decade since the 1960s. 
And it wasn't really buildable until we um, kind of revived this back around 2013. It's a bit on hold now because it's too expensive for what we're willing, people are willing to pay. But this starshade has to formation fly tens of thousands of kilometers. We have time for a couple more questions. Yes. Second space race has been fantastic for astronomy. Our test mission I told you about, we launched in a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket, and there was so much extra room. It would be like having this whole room as like your bedroom. Maybe not like that much extra space, because it was still cheaper. So they're basically bringing the cost down, and they're willing to take risks that we're not willing to take. So I asked who would go to an exoplanet. Who would go to Mars? Like Mars, you know, but how do we get to Mars? Like, we don't want to risk human lives, you know? But like in the private industry, if Elon Musk wants to go to Mars, you know, he can take that risk. And so, you know, we know how to get to Mars, we know how to land on Mars, we haven't yet uh, launched off of Mars. But so they're bringing the costs down and taking extra risk that our government's not willing or able to take. So it's all good in that regard. Yes. So the question is, uh, astrobiology, what would an astrobiologist do? And astrobiology is trying to understand the origin of life on Earth, the evolution of life here, and life's existence elsewhere. And so some of what I talked about was astrobiology. Um, some astrobiologists like go out to the, I have an astrobiologist uh, colleague, he's right now in the Atacama Desert high in Chile, uh, searching for life in very, very dry environments. People will search for life in extreme environments. Um, people want to find life on Mars or life on Jupiter's icy moons that appear to have water. So it's like such a huge umbrella of things, actually. But if you were to go to a college and study astrobiology, you would have a discipline for yourself first. You'd have to study biology or chemistry or astronomy or physics. And then sort of on top of that, you would be exposed to like a more variety of fields in that area or, you know, crossing disciplines. Okay, people are um, starting to wind down here, so let me just take one last question. The uh, signature from Venus that we wanted to visit, was that something you were working on? Yes, yeah, so the Venus talk was earlier today. And, okay, I'm just going to take a minute to explain this about Venus here. So let me just take a minute, because it reflects on the search for life on another world. And I was involved with this incredibly exciting discovery of a gas on Venus, phosphine which here on Earth, phosphine is only associated with life. Most phosphorus, uh, it's not in the molecule phosphine, it's in a different type of molecule called phosphate. And this discovery was amazing because Venus shouldn't have phosphine. Just like that story of oxygen on Earth, it reacts in the atmosphere, it's not made by any process we know, and it's just like, whoa, what is this, you know? And if it's not made by anything we know about, there gives an outside chance that that gas might be made by life. And this phosphine is not, we don't think, associated with the surface of Venus, which is too hot for life of any kind, but high up in the clouds of Venus. We're imagining little microbes just floating around in the cloud particles. This phosphine story, it's an incredible journey. It has unfolded um, to be very controversial. People have looked at the data and not recovered the signal. Others have recovered the signal in the data that's now public and don't want it to be phosphine. They're trying to associate it with another gas. So the story of phosphine, it's really interesting because it's like a bit of a fast forward to when someone says, oh, well, I think I found a sign of life on an exoplanet. I think the community will be very skeptical. Is there a signal? Is the signal robust? Is the signal correctly attributed? But it takes a long time for things to unfold. And we hope to send missions back to Venus to like look directly in the atmosphere and look for phosphine and other gases. That was like a short answer to what's unfolding to be an incredibly exciting field of research. They might have to, oh.
Testing. <laughs> um, just as a small token of our appreciation, it's kind of a tradition for us to uh, give a small gift. So I want you thank to you so much. And thank you, Dr. Seeger, once again for uh, delivering your talk. Thank you. I'll just, should I tell the students? Or? Um, do we have the QR code for projection? We do. So uh, whether it's here or out in the lobby, for those students looking for their